Thanks very much, everyone, for coming. So it's a real pleasure to introduce Paul Smolensky today. So um, Paul Smolensky is a professor of cognitive science at Johns Hopkins University. And he's well known for uh, many different things. So just a couple of them is being one of the founding members of the PDP uh, Parallel Distributed Processing Group and also for being one of the creators of optimality theory, which is a hugely influential uh, paradigm in linguistics. Um, and he's also won the, the uh, Rummelhart Prize, which is one of the, the, for his contributions to theoretical cognitive science. So um, thanks very much for, for um, joining us. And your time. Thanks very much for your hospitality. Thanks, Paul, for arranging all of this. Um, it's great to be here. Uh, since I don't really know what defining cognitive science means, I thought I would start off by saying something that might qualify as that, uh, which is uh, something about the kind of work that I'll be telling you about what kind of cognitive science research it is. So uh, if the credo of cognitive science is cognition is computation, then the big question, what we call the problem of cognitive architecture, and that's what this research is about, is what type of computation is cognition. What are the parameters of the physical machine? What are the programming language cap capabilities of the software? And there have been two primary kinds of answers, others as well, but primarily uh, the founding of the field was based on an answer that said it's symbolic computation, uh, discrete digital computation, logic-based, uh, or derivatives of logic. You might think of this as a kind of mind-driven view of what the cognitive architecture is like. And then the PDP group, which Paul mentioned in the 80s and work preceding it, uh, tried to pursue um, an alternative called the connectionist architecture, which uses neural network like processing uh, continuous activation spreading uh, computation that's more brain-driven, if you like. And while much um, <coughs> energy has gone into deciding which of these is the right way to go, it's clear that both are the right way to go. So uh, the proposal, the integrated connectionist symbolic cognitive architecture that I'll be telling you about today, um, uh, is conceived as follows. The key to understanding it is understanding uh, the difference between a macrostructural theory and a microstructural theory. So that's familiar to those of you who uh, have seen in computer science how one in the same system, if you look at it uh, from a high abstract level, uh, looks like a desktop with folders and images. Uh, but if you look at the microstructure, you see something entirely different, a bunch of bits, no pictures, no folders. Uh, that's not particularly baffling, uh, although it's baffling to me that it actually works, uh, but the concept is clear enough. Uh, in physics, we have a similar relationship between the macrostructure in something, for example, uh, like a gas, where we have temperature and pressure and other variables of the gas as a, as a mass. Uh, but at the microstructural level, we see uh, a very different picture. Individual molecules, uh, they don't have temperature, they don't have pressure, they have velocity, uh, momentum, and so on. But we understand a lot about that relationship, too. So we want to emulate that kind of relationship in cognitive science. I would say it's, it's more interesting in cognitive science because uh, the macrostructural level is discrete and symbolic, like the macrostructural level in the computer science case. But the microstructural level of neural network activations uh, looks more like the physics micro level. So between the micro and the macro level, you get a qualitative shift in the kind of architecture you're working with. Uh, and that's why this is called the integrated connectionist on the bottom, symbolic on the top architecture. So uh, the plan for the talk is to talk sequentially uh, about the following three key aspects uh, of any theory of cognition. Uh, first, how is information represented in the cognitive architecture that you're proposing? How is knowledge encoded? And how uh, is that knowledge used in processing? Uh, I'll be telling you first about how that looks at the higher macro level, the mental level. Uh, each of those three things. Uh, then we'll talk about how things look at the microstructural neural level in terms of connectionist networks. Uh, and we'll talk about how you can reduce the mental to the neural in this architecture, what the relationship between the two of them is. 
Uh, I will try to show you pictures to the extent that I can, down there in the lower left, and give you a running synopsis of the talk in the lower right. So if you're, even if your memory isn't as horrific as mine, it may help you to have uh, some trace of where we've been uh, and maybe a little bit of idea where we're going. So starting with representation at the mental level. Uh, here we have uh, symbol structures. Uh, this is true in all domains of cognition, uh, higher cognition. Uh, but of special interest to us is language. And there, to look at a simplified example, uh, we have an extremely simple sentence here, given an extremely simple syntactic structure that no syntactician would advocate. Um, a simple subject, uh, predicate, uh, noun phrase, verb phrase, structure. Uh, so our very first point is that mental representations uh, are symbol structures. Now about knowledge, uh, the key idea here is going to be a notion called harmony. Using uh, rules, uh, we can devise grammars for language and corresponding uh, knowledge systems in other domains uh, that are based on the idea that um, the representations that the mind uses when uh, working in a problem domain, working with language, working with uh, uh, reasoning, whatever the problem domain, that the representations um, are the best ones uh, with respect to satisfying the rules, the regularities that are characteristic of that domain of, of uh, cognition. And so the extent to which representations satisfy these regularities uh, is called harmony. So maximal harmony means best satisfaction of those regularities. So the harmony, uh, H, is the well-formedness uh, or goodness of a mental representation. It also incorporates other factors like the relevance to the current uh, problem that you're um, cognizing. It also incorporates elements like uh, the fami familiarity of the elements in this structure. Uh, and all of these things tend to promote the extent to which the representation is a, a good appropriate one to be using at any given moment in cognitive processing. In the um, case of the linguistic representations uh, in the mind, the harmony of a representation like that is exactly what a grammar gives you. Uh, so in, uh, in language, we call these harmonic grammars. It's not, the cons uh, it's not a, a conventional notion of grammar, but it, this harmony-based notion, we'll see, allows us to connect the macrostructural level and the microstructural level in a way that's hard to do if you use more traditional theories of grammar. Uh, so um, in the uh, little teeny example we saw before, we can identify examples of all of these different aspects of harmony. So uh, the well-formedness aspects uh, include uh, constraints of grammar that say things like uh, a subject must have, a sentence must have a subject. Uh, so the simple sentence reigns violates this rule, it doesn't have a subject. Whereas it reigns, has a subject, it satisfies it. And each of these constraints has a strength in the given grammar. And for expository purposes, let's imagine that the strength in English of this constraint is two. Uh, whereas the second well formed is constraint that says uh, you should not have meaningless words in sentences. For example, you shouldn't have the word it in it reigns. Uh, again, has a strength. Uh, and let's say that's three in English which allows us to evaluate the harmony with respect to these uh, rules of that structure. Um, what we violate is the second rule because we have a meaningless word um, and uh, we have a penalty of what should be. Um, uh, oh, this is bad. Well, let's see, we'll continue. And uh, the alternative structure, which we has no uh, subject, violates the do not have a subject constraint. And um, that incurs a penalty of minus three. Uh, that's the way uh, these constraints should have been uh, uh, assigned values. So I apologize for uh, having them backwards. The idea is that in English, uh, the first constraint is more important than the second one. It has a higher strength. So it should be three and the other two. Um, which means that the penalty that you pay for having a meaningless word 
uh, minus two, in the first option, it rains, is uh, a smaller penalty than you would pay if you omitted the subject uh, and had the simple sentence rains. So the higher harmony structure there is the first one, it rains. And that is uh, the reason that, according to this kind of grammar, uh, we say uh, the sentence this way, as opposed to a language like Italian, uh, where the grammatical structures are different. Here I have them uh, probably backwards as well. Let's see. Um, the Strength uh, in Italian, let's say, of the um, uh, first constraint about having a subject is the same, but in Italian there is a smaller penalty to pay uh, for having, um, for not having, oh, sh good lord, um, too late at night. So the idea is, uh, it's higher mathematics is where I tend to fall apart. Um, <laughs> so forgive me for that. Um, the idea is that in English, the constraint that says sentences must have subject is stronger. You pay a bigger penalty if you violate it. Uh, but in Italian, the constraint against meaningless words is stronger. Uh, and therefore, the Italian version, like uh, esso piove, which violates don't have a meaningless word, is actually a more serious violation than just omitting the subject altogether and saying piove, which is what uh, the correct Italian expression would be. So the idea is that there are well formed constraints from, from grammars that vary in strength from language to language with the consequence that the best representations, the one that describe what the grammar says we should utter when we want to express these, uh, varies from language to language, but in a very specific and analyzable way. Okay, so uh, that is an il illustration, utterly botched, of how uh, the first component, well formed contributes to harmony. Uh, and the collectively, these kinds of rules uh, or constraints with their weights constitute uh, a harmonic grammar for a language. The other considerations mentioned uh, were, for example, relevance. If uh, we are uh, not talking about a, a weather context, then we would pay a harmony penalty for using words like rains. Uh, if and that would be very relevant when you're trying to understand what you're hearing, uh, and it may not be so clear, the context uh, about what words are relevant will help you uh, disambiguate uh, messages. In terms of familiarity, um, if the word in question reigns uh, were a low frequency word, uh, then there would be a penalty to be paid in the structure for that as well. Uh, and collectively, these kinds of considerations uh, all bundled together uh, form uh, the notion of harmony. And the idea is that to know uh, language is to know all of these things. Um, and to know that, uh, given this set of knowledge about what uh, constitutes high harmony, uh, how to then produce uh, mental representations of sentences or other things that um, have high harmony. So knowledge consists of harmony, of knowing the harmony of possible representations. Um, and cognition deploys optimal representations that maximize this harmony. We're going to think about that in terms of uh, a little picture like this. So in our representational space, uh, we have, I've illustrated just four possible structures here. We have it rains and we have rains, uh, the two dots uh, labeled there. We have, for example, another one where the word it is inserted as an object instead of a subject, rains it. We have another possibility where it's inserted both as a subject and an object. Um, and in general, there are a whole lot of these alternative mental structures, and each of them has a certain harmony value. We can plot them on the vertical uh, dimension. It rains is the best, it has the highest harmony, uh, and the others have lower values, uh, in English at least. Um, so that's a picture of uh, what representational space looks like when viewed from the perspective of uh, harmony or goodness. Okay. Um, the uh, highest harmony one pointed to there uh, is the one that the cognitive system uh, ought to be deploying in a situation where uh, this is the relevant message. Okay, so we've talked about representation and knowledge and uh, now the next step is processing. And here the, basic, the, key, I the key idea is uh, optimization. So um, the idea is that uh, uh, when we are using our knowledge of grammar or 
rules of any sort in, in inference or problem solving. Um, what we're doing is computing uh, those structures that have maximal harmony. Uh, we're computing the optimal representations. Um, and in general reasoning, you can think about this as a kind of inference to the best explanation, where harmony is a measure of best. Uh, in the language context, this specific kind of inference uh, with respect to grammatical harmony uh, is often called parsing. And so in the case we were talking about, if I were listening to a sentence and I heard it rained, then the job of the parser is to map that onto the appropriate structure uh, that has the highest harmony with respect to the grammar of English, something like that. So uh, mental representations, uh, mental processes, uh, have the job of computing optimal representations. What that means is it's that computation that uh, somehow the uh, mind-brain has to do. It has to produce uh, the highest harmony structure among a set of alternative structures. OK, so uh, now uh, we're going to move from uh, the high level, the macro level of the mental, uh, down to the neural level and talk about these same three ingredients of the architecture at a lower level. So um, what we first have in the way of representations is uh, activation patterns. Uh, so in uh, a neural network or connectionist uh, model of cognition, information is represented at the microstructure level by distributed patterns of neural activation. And uh, we can picture those in various ways. Uh, this is one conventional sort of way. Each of those dots is uh, an abstract neuron, if you like, a, a unit in the network. And the, act and the activation values are indicated by the size of the corresponding uh, dots, with positive and negative values indicated by uh, white and black. Uh, or we can use this kind of representation, which will be more useful, uh, where the, the uh, plane there is the activation space of all possible activation patterns. So one of those patterns, which has activation one on the first unit and point two in the second unit, is that blue point there. And the coordinate axes that uh, give the activation values of the two units that define this two-dimensional activation space are indicated by those arrows. So um, uh, the synoptic point here is to just recall that neural rep at the neural level, representations are distributed activation patterns. They don't look anything like symbol structures at this level, just like molecules don't look a whole lot like gases. The next um, thing to discuss then is the uh, knowledge at the neural level. Uh, whereas uh, representations are activation patterns, knowledge is encoded in connections, in connectionist networks. So uh, if we try to picture what that looks like in this kind of picture, uh, what you'll typically see is a whole bunch of lines, each of which constitutes a path for activation to flow uh, with weights on each line. So each vertex in that grid uh, has a weight associated with it which determines how much activation flows uh, from one unit to another unit through that juncture. And that distributed pattern of connection weights, or strengths, uh, is how knowledge is encoded uh, in connectionist networks. What I'll show you in a moment is that uh, the job of these connections is uh, to optimize neural harmony. So like rules and gra of, uh, of grammars, these connections are in the business of determining uh, the various uh, harmony levels of alternative representations, um, be they sentences or whatever. And at the neural level, harmony looks like this. Uh, the amount of harmony that's contributed uh, by a single connection with strength WJK between a unit J and a unit K, that contribution to the total harmony of a state of the network, an activation pattern, um, is simply the product of the activation of the two units and the weight connecting them. Couldn't be much simpler. Um, but if you add these together over all of the connections in an entire network, you get a single number that represents the extent to which an activation pattern conforms to uh, what uh, those weights are uh, trying to drive these units to be uh, active, inactive, and so on. OK. So neural connections are how we encode harmony uh, at the microscopic level. 
We can picture this uh, in the other way, uh, rather than lines and circles. Uh, we have our activation space at the bottom. Uh, and now each point in that activation space is a different activation pattern. It's a continuous space. Uh, and each of those points has a, an activation value, which a, a harmony value, which is plotted on the vertical axis here, giving us a smooth surface. For example, uh, the highest harmony uh, activation pattern is uh, in the plane at the locus where that yellow line uh, arrives, because it is uh, the line that goes up to the peak of that surface. The way that um, connections are used to achieve um, the kind of inference and parsing that constitutes finding the optimal uh, representation, the way that connections are used is that activation spreads through them. So a an activation pattern at one moment will send activation through a whole bunch of connections, and depending on how those connections are weighted, will give rise to a different activation pattern at the next moment, and that will iterate until the network settles down. Uh, and when it settles down, it will have produced an activation uh, pattern, which is its uh, output for the given uh, moment of, of processing we're talking about. Um, and it turns out that in appropriate networks, uh, spreading activation is simply a processing algorithm that optimizes that neural harmony function that we talked about on the previous slide. So if you record uh, the numerical value of the harmony of the activation pattern as activation spreads, you'll see that it gets higher and higher uh, until it peaks. Uh, at the end of the computation. So spreading activation uh, is a matter of uh, crawling up the surface to try to find the highest point in the, um, on the harmony surface, the highest harmony representation. So we can think about that, and it'll be useful in a little bit later, um, as an ant crawling up the surface, trying to get to the top of the surface. Um, and uh, the the way that the ant moves along the surface uh, constitutes a path in activation space below it, uh, which is exactly what the equations for the sp activation spreading of the network determine. And the activation spreading rules that are used in our networks uh, have a random component to them. So uh, the ant is trying to go uphill, but it's kind of like a drunk ant. It's staggering around. On average, it's going uphill, but it's kind of wandering around, trying to find the um, harmony peak. Uh, and our network is doing just that. OK, so spreading activation is a means of optimizing harmony, harmony being encoded in the connections in the neural network. OK, um, so we've talked about uh, these three critical components at both the mental level of macrostructure, the neural level of microstructure. And now I want to talk about how you reduce the mental to the neural. That is to say, how are these connected to each other? Um, and uh, there, uh, we, at each of these three points, there's a critical idea for how these are connected. And in the case of uh, representations, uh, the idea goes under the name of tensor products. And the idea of tensor product representations is this. Um, if you have a set of symbol structures, you want, as your mental representations, that is to say, uh, states of the mind brain viewed at the macroscopic level, if you have a set of symbol structures that you want, uh, then you can determine a set of activation patterns that realize them uh, using this kind of scheme. What it does is it gives you distributed activation patterns uh, which uh, relate to one another in a way that is isomorphic to, that parallels the relatinos, the relations among the corresponding symbol structures. Uh, and um, I, it would take a bit more time than I think we have to elaborate what that means. We can talk about it in the question period if you want. Um, but what it means to parallel the relations among symbol structures uh, is strong enough that you can actually take recursive functions defined over uh, symbol structures that map, s systematically map some kind of, let's say, tree structure like we had for it rains into uh, other tree structures. Uh, and you can compute those functions uh, over the activation patterns that realize them using simple networks. And you can write down what those networks need to be for a given recursive function that you want to implement at the symbolic level. So it's not just a loose analogy. It's a, a, a proper 
useful mathematical relationship. And um, unfortunately, I don't have time to give you a picture, but maybe we can come back to that if that turns out to be uh, what you're interested in seeing. Uh, so the synoptic point here is that symbol structures are here viewed as abstract descriptions of distributed patterns of neural activation. Uh, there is one thing, and you can look at it at two levels, and you see a symbolic structure at one level, and you see an activation pattern at the other. Um, having talked about uh, the representations, we move on to talking about the relation between the macro and micro level descriptions uh, for harmony, for knowledge. Um, and here, uh, the key notion that we're going to have to introduce uh, involves uh, the grid. Um, so what, is, what do I mean by that? Well, uh, the key point is that not all activation states in our neural network are symbolically interpretable. Uh, so if we go back to our picture here, um, those four points are symbolically interpretable as those four sentences. But there are all the other activation patterns there too. Uh, and our neural network has a continuous set of, uh, of states available to it that the plane designates. And only select ones, only a discrete grid of those points uh, actually does the job of realizing symbol structures. And those are the only uh, states, or at least approximations to those states, are the only ones uh, that uh, have cognitive significance. So uh, the grid is the subset of the set of all activation patterns uh, which have sim uh, symbolic interpretations. OK, so the grid is the set of symbolically interpretable patterns. Uh, we can look now um, at the uh, two pictures simultaneously of our uh, activation. What is that? Yeah, that looks a little better. Um, so let's see here. Yeah, this, this got out of sequence. I apologize. So let's just show what happens here. Um, the idea is that we saw two pictures, and we're now seeing them as one in the same picture. We saw that, that these four uh, symbol structures each have their own harmony according to some grammar. Uh, and the vertical purple lines indicated those. Um, we saw a smooth surface, of, which is the harmony values of the neural states. And it's possible to find uh, sets of connections which achieve this kind of matching, where the harmony associated with the neural state uh, is the same as the harmony the grammar assigns to that state if the state is a grid state. In other words, if it has a symbolic interpretation, it makes sense to ask the symbolic harmonic grammar what the harmony of that symbol structure is. Uh, so you can think of the activation space uh, for the neural network as interpolating between uh, and constituting many uh, smooth blends of uh, alternative uh, symbolic structures. But it's the grid points that we're interested in producing in the end of our computation. Uh, we want to produce those symbol structures that have the highest harmony according to our rules of grammar and uh, uh, relevance and so on. So um, uh, it's that particular point that we want to compute. Uh, and that's distinct from this point here, which we, we saw earlier. Uh, the highest harmony activation pattern uh, is not a grid state. Uh, it's some blend of uh, symbolic structures. And that's not an acceptable output. What we want is the uh, upper left corner there, the, the activation pattern that encodes the symbol structure it reigns. It has the highest activation value of any of the points on the grid, but not the highest of all the uh, points in the activation space. Uh, and because of that, we have to do some extra work. So um, we have to do the following. We have to introduce new connections in addition to what we had before. In addition to the connections that encode the rules of the grammar, uh, we need new connections, which produce a kind of processing uh, called uh, quantization. Uh, what that looks like um, is a set of connections that produce an attractor at every grid point. That is to say, a set of connections which send activation uh, around in the network in such a way as to push the activation state to uh, one of the grid points. And it looks something like this. Those are the, it's a depiction of the, of the force uh, that is used to push the state of the network um, w when these new connections are added to the network. So what we have is uh, simultaneously these two different 
uh, dynamical structures. Uh, at the bottom, you see here the depiction of the quantization dynamics. And on the top, what you see is the ant trying to climb up the harmony surface. And what we're actually uh, pursuing in this um, architecture is doing these two dynamics simultaneously. Uh, and what does that look like from the perspective of the ant? Well, it looks like this. Early on in the computation, uh, it's set up so that the quantization dynamics is weak, but the optimization dynamics is strong. So at the beginning of the computation, the ant is just climbing up the hill. But as computation proceeds, the, comp the quantization dynamics get stronger and stronger, uh, swamping the uh, uh, harmony dynamics. That is to say, as the quantization dynamics get stronger, in effect, the harmony value of all the points off the grid is dragged down. So as the computation proceeds and the quantization dynamics get stronger and stronger, effectively, the surface uh, is what is this? The surface is doing this. Uh, th this is a state early on in the network, not very early, but uh, when the quantization dynamics has started to pull down the goodness of points off the grid and deforms the surface like that, it's no longer the case that that yellow point is the best. It's still the case that the one that we want is the highest harmony. Uh, it's now a, a peak that's the highest peak of this set of mountains. And as the uh, computation proceeds, those peaks get steeper and steeper as the uh, harmony of the points on the grid rises relative to the points off the grid. And so what the ant's job is, is to climb up that surface in such a way as to end up at the highest peak. That's what the network uh, dynamics is doing. All right, so uh, we have added new connections so that now spreading activation creates symbolically interpretable representations uh, at the same time as uh, harmony is being optimized uh, and therefore the rules of the grammar or the knowledge of the cognitive domain in question is being respected. When you do them simultaneously, uh, you get optimal symbolically interpretable representations. That's the net result. So that's the story about the architecture. And now I will tell you just a little bit about the kind of results that we've gotten uh, in our initial explorations of trying to use this cognitive architecture to study phenomena in um, uh, psycholinguistics. So we've uh, looked at simple models of all the following generalizations and showed how this architecture allows us to understand why uh, human uh, language processing has these characteristics. Um, when speakers make errors, uh, the errors favor grammatical productions. Um, if you make a speech error, uh, you almost never produce something which is not a possible word of English. You don't violate the rules of phonology when you make speech uh, errors, and uh, you respect many of the principles of syntax when you word, when you word move sentences around in the, when you move words in around in sentences um, errors uh, tend to favor frequent forms if you make an error you're more likely to produce a more frequent item uh, erroneously than a le less frequent one um, they tend to increase the well-formedness you might substitute an item in an error for one that better satisfies uh, the uh, constraints that has higher harmony in other words when items move around, uh, be they words in sentences or uh, sounds in words, uh, they tend to preserve the structural position. If a sound is mis misplaced in a spoonerism, then uh, if it's supposed to be at the beginning of a syllable, it'll be produced erroneously somewhere. Much more likely, it'll be erroneously produced at the beginning of another syllable. So the structural positions of items tend to be preserved when errors are made. And all of those things, uh, are aspects of uh, production uh, that have been difficult to capture in more um, simple-minded views of processing with connectionist networks because those more simple systems have not been able to incorporate structural information, grammatical information, uh, well-formedness uh, into them. But this system is designed to do just that, to give us neural networks that uh, incorporate 
uh, structure and knowledge uh, of a grammatical sort. Now, what's new relative to the symbolic approaches that uh, can describe at least the phenomena above uh, is that it also turns out that errors bear gradient traces of the correct form. So when a, a D is mispronounced as a T, uh, it's not produced the same way as it would be if that T were correct in that, in that word. Uh, if you say bat instead of bad in some sort of speeded production task where you uh, make a mistake. If you look at the, uh, the T that is formed erroneously in detail, uh, look at the phonetic properties of it, what you'll see is that um, it's a little bit closer that T is, to the D, which was the correct sound. Uh, so in the erroneous form, is a little trace of the correct form that's not present when it's not an error. So uh, our view of that here is that even though the quantization dynamics is pushing towards the grid, towards uh, pure states that don't have a little bit of some other symbol or sound mixed into them, it's pushing to pure states. Um, at, at any given finite amount of time, it would only have gotten so close to a grid point. And um, it turns out that if you end up at the wrong grid point, you're not going to be as close to it uh, at the end of computation. And therefore, you'll be pulled away from the grid point in the direction of the correct form a little bit. Uh, and that seems to be the nature of the kind of errors that people make in, in phonological errors. Another generalization is that uh, more well-formed uh, items produce fewer errors. So uh, with respect to phonology, some words ha have better sound structures than others. And the better formed words uh, produce fewer errors than the less well-formed ones. And they're produced faster to introduce another aspect of this. All the others have to do with errors. But this has to do with the speed of computation. Uh, and an important aspect of this project for me is that uh, it's not just that we can cook up models that simulate or, or uh, duplicate these patterns uh, in uh, human behavior. Uh, it's also the case that we can provide explanations of those uh, because, at least in these simple cases, and in theory, it should apply to more complex ones, um, the uh, relative harmony or well-formedness of different um, possible error outputs, for example, uh, predict their probability. In other words, uh, it's not just that you run a simulation and you find out if an error is made, it's much more likely to be this than this. Uh, we can understand why that's true. It's because the harmony of this is higher than the harmony of this. Neither of them have the maximal harmony. They're not correct. Uh, but one has higher harmony, is uh, more well-formed. And uh, the way this architecture is constructed, uh, it's uh, understood why the more well-formed one is more probable. Uh, and a lot of these error patterns then uh, are explained in this way, not just uh, simulated. And one little picture, which I won't take the time to, to drag you through of that, is uh, a simulation of a simple uh, version of this network, uh, which is producing uh, syllables that have uh, initial consonants and final consonants. Um, so, uh, so you might be trying to produce this two sequence syllable bat ken uh, with a consonant vowel consonant syllable followed by another one. Uh, in this uh, model, we are ignoring the vowels as the, is done in this, the kind of experiment that these data tend to come from uh, and just focus on the consonants. So uh, the target is to produce, the correct output would be uh, a syllable consisting of the first consonant followed by the second and then a syllable consisting of the third consonant followed by the fourth. Um, we're just giving them numbers instead of name is like ba de ka. Um, but uh, what you see here, uh, if you run the model many times, uh, because it has a random element, doesn't produce the same answer each time, um, you see that uh, these are the probabilities of various outputs that are incorrect. These are the probabilities of errors, uh, the highest of which is something like 7.5% there. Uh, and they're ordered from uh, the most frequent error uh, down. And what you see is that the most frequent errors are the ones that preserve the position. So instead of producing 1, 2, 3, 4, the first response there is 1, 4, 3, 4. So 4 has erroneously been copied into the previous syllable, but preserving the fact that it's at the end of the syllable. Uh, or 1, 2, 3, 2 is the case where 
the uh, second consonant of the first syllable was copied erroneously into the second one. So the most uh, common errors, the red bars on the left, are ones where the posi position of an item is preserved even though it's in the wrong place. Uh, the next group, the green group, uh, are ones where the syllable is pre preserved. It's produced in uh, the wrong place, but the right syllable. Uh, then you have errors where nothing is preserved. They're less likely. And then you start getting into uh, double errors. Uh, the most likely ones are the ones, uh, sorry, the, the, the zero preserved are the, are the single errors uh, in which neither syllable nor position is preserved. So all those are, so are single letter consonant errors. Uh, and then come uh, the errors where two of the consonants are wrong, like the last one, 12, 12. The entire second syllable is wrong. You have two consonants that are incorrect. But the ones that are most likely among those, admittedly, they're all pretty unlikely. But the most likely of them are the ones where the, the two in incorrect consonants are in their correct position, albeit in the wrong syllable. OK, so you run the simulation. You get a pattern like this. It's nice, because this rep replicates what we see in uh, human performance. I don't want to mislead you into thinking that this is, is uh, experimental data. This, this is not. This is a simulation that has the right qualitative predictions to match the uh, experimental data that uh, has been uh, produced in a number of uh, experiments that produce many speech errors. The point here, though, is that not only can we run that simulation and get that uh, nice set of results, we can understand why it's coming out that way, because we can compute the harmony of all those different errors. Every one of those has a harmony value. And according to the way this architecture is constructed, the higher the harmony of the output, the more probable it should be. And so I'll show you the harmony values for all of those different errors. It looks like this. OK, it has the same qualitative shape as the uh, experiments uh, run with the simulation model. Uh, and in general, uh, we see that the behavior of the model is quite understandable from the perspective uh, of uh, the general principle underlying all of it, which is that uh, the knowledge encoded in our mind brain uh, consists of a harmony function, which measures the goodness of alternative representations. And processing is a, in the business of optimizing well-formedness and computing the best ones. It doesn't always succeed. But when it fails, the higher the harmony, the better the error, the more likely it is to produce it. Uh, and that makes me feel like we're doing more than just simulating. We're getting some insight into the origin of these uh, kinds of properties of the human language performance system uh, by building a model that is basically based primarily on uh, the human language competence system, which is what we uh, embody in our grammars. So I'll stop there. What happens to those once you finish the computation and you begin a new one? Do they simply go away, which is what's, what's required for the process to start anew and get to the, the correct maximum? Or <coughs> Uh, it is correct that um, the, to say that the strength of the quantization increases is to say that the uh, strength of all of those uh, connections increases at, at, as the computation proceeds and then drops back down again to a low level for the next one. So I don't think about it as disappearing, but I do think about it as there being an overall modulatory effect during the course of the computation uh, that takes those particular connections and makes them stronger. Uh, and resets when a new computation begins. Uh, where do they come from? Well, the idea is uh, that uh, the ability to have these symbolic representations um, is a result of some special structure that the network has. Uh, and it's not necessarily a structure that can be learned. It's not necessarily structure that can't be learned either. Uh, the idea is that what these quantization connections are doing is enforcing a competition that only allows one symbol to uh, be present in any given role. So all of the blend states that are off the grid involve you know, a little bit of this symbol, a little bit of that symbol, both in the same structural position. And those special constraints are penalizing those kind of states. and 
pushing towards states where you have a single symbol with strength one and all the other symbols at that location having strength zero. Uh, if the representations you're learning from uh, had a structure like that, then you might be able to learn connections that enforce it. But it's a, it's a chicken and egg situation then of the sort that we're used to in, in bootstrapping the learning of symbolic systems. Okay, good question. Hi, um, just to go back to the beginning of your talk, or the whole uh, foundation of your talk was to um, say, no, it's not a matter of either connectionist representation or symbolic. We've got two things going on here. So I'm wondering what you think of the idea of kind of putting that idea on steroids, since clearly from your talk it was quite powerful, made sense of a lot of data, of saying that, well, it's not really two levels of representation or two levels of mechanisms. We're probably dealing with a hierarchy of levels or a collection of hierarchy uh, of levels. For instance, if you look at the McCulloch and Pitts neuron, that was quite simple. So the connections neurons improved on that, made it a little bit more complex. Now, um, I don't clearly understand this, but uh, I heard Seth Grant speaking about, um, you know, synapses themselves now are being viewed as mini computers. So we've got within the neuron, there's computation going on. Uh, if you look at a computer uh, program, there's, you know, a concept of stack comes up again and again. You have virtual machines that are embedded in virtual machines that are embedded in physical machines. So what do you think of the idea of taking your idea kind of into hyperspace and and blowing this up into multiple levels? I think it's good. <laughs> I think it's right. So um, the idea that there are uh, only two levels of organization in the mind-brain is con clearly far from the truth. Uh, so um, if there are ways of understanding the kind of computation that's being done at other levels uh, such that you can connect them to the higher levels, if we can understand the kind of computer that a synapse is in a way that's going to allow us to build higher level virtual machines that do cognition, then that's great. Of course, it becomes harder and harder to do that as the uh, machine you're looking at gets more and more molecular uh, or gets complex, complex in other ways. It's hard to understand it well enough to see how you could use it as the basis of building a higher level virtual machine that's useful for something. Which is interesting because that sounds a bit like the argument people used to make against connectionists or dynamic models is that, well, you know, it's complicated. How are you going to make sense of those Yeah, well, and the answer is the same. Here's a way to do it. You were right, we didn't know before. Now we have an idea. And the more of those we get, the more we can do that. Thank you. I just wanted to know if, there, is there a notion of compositionality in harmonic grammar? Or is it non-compositional? The, um, The use of tensor product representations as a way of realizing symbol structures allows uh, for all the kinds of properties of symbolic uh, computation that uh, Fodor and Polition were emphasizing the importance of. So they are systematic. Uh, they s can support compositionality. They don't require it. Neither does the symbolic uh, architecture require it. Um, but it, it provides the means to do it. Neurobiologically, or perhaps regarding imaging, there is that the um, this tensor product kind of setup is uh, plausible or or is relevant to what we might actually do in the brain. Well, uh, one example um, is uh, work in um, the mapping of receptive fields of. Uh, neurons that uh, model, that, sorry, that encode um, uh, eye-dependent position of, uh, of points in the visual field. And if you look at those uh, receptive fields, you'll see that they are essentially a tensor product of two things, uh, a representation 
of the orientation of the eye and a representation relative to the orientation of the eye of uh, the point in the visual field. Um, the, uh, the basic idea of tensor products uh, is all about um, uh, conjunction and multiplication of uh, strengths of uh, features. So wherever conjunction or multiplication of uh, features to produce new representations is discussed, that's in the, in the space that tensor products live. Uh, the, the best answer I hope we'll have at some point in the not terribly distant future uh, from work that we're trying to do to use uh, tensor product structure as a way of doing multivoxel pattern analysis to see whether the uh, combinatorial structure of representations in the brain of, uh, for example, syllables uh, can be extracted uh, and reveal that you have the same kind of relations among those patterns of activation uh, in the fMRI scans that we have in this theory. But we don't know if that's going to work out yet. Is there always just one ant? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think so. <laughs> um, did you have something specific yeah, in mind? It just reminded me of the codelets in uh, Douglas Hobson's fluid analogy models, like on the parallel parallel scan. I don't know if you're familiar with this model. Uh, I'm not sure I'm familiar with exactly the, the, the Hofstadter architects you have in mind, although I'm familiar with some of them. Well, um, no. Uh, I think um, uh, the problem that I have is mapping uh, the notion of multiple ants into the state of a neural network. Uh, so uh, the way I think about uh, the, the surface is that the network can only have one pattern of activation at a time. It can only be at one place on the surface at one time. What would be the meaning of it have two, having two activation patterns at the same time? Well, there is a little bit of meaning of that, because in tensor product representations are all about, in fact, superimposing patterns of activation that correspond to different symbolic constituents that are co-resonant in the same structure. But it would be, it, it would be um, strange to say that the network is simultaneously having those patterns. It has one pattern, which happens to be a sum of superposition of other ones. Uh, but maybe it's possible to think about those uh, individual uh, elements in the superposition as th themselves ants that um, are uh, superimposed in the network. That's interesting. Hmm. Thank you. Sure. I think I'm changing my answer to maybe. <laughs> Thank you. Anything to make my my research more expensive. I think I can. Um, this uh, slide here. Um, let's see. Yeah, this is. Well, you see a lot of part of the soup of one part. Um, well, is this the one that you meant, or a different one? Uh, uh, no, the upper left hand quadrant. Uh, okay. That, that, that yes. Um, um, I, I guess, given all your talk, you, you would have said something about the uh, the life cycle of these interactions for not only applying. Given facility language in familiar situations, but uh, things like um, uh, 
a detection of the need for a new symbol. Uh, something new comes up, there's no good term for it, a neologism is formed, or um, uh, an explanation is required because uh, nothing else is adequate. And uh, that sort of, or early or present day uh, syntacticians uh, deriving rules of grammar and uh, or application and judging that they're better than others. Uh, the, there's some dynamics in this that I think would be interesting, and I guess time didn't really permit covering up today, but uh, is that part of your larger analysis? Um, it's, uh, it wouldn't be honest to say that it was lack of time that prevented me talking about that because I haven't worked on that. Uh, but uh, it is the case that uh, when you're uh, doing harmony maximization, uh, the, there are competing forces. And um, it could be that, uh, at least with some significant probability, uh, you would end up creating uh, a structure that involves a new symbol. Um, and using, getting that new, system, that new symbol recruited into a system uh, would take a certain amount of work that I'm not sure I would know how to do. Uh, but the idea is that um, the space of patterns that can be used for uh, pattern for symbols is potentially open-ended and beyond the ones that have been recruited at any given time. Uh, there would be uh, a disharmony associated with using a symbol that had no meaning to you, but that would not be infinite, and it could mean that using a new symbol would be better than using any of the ones you have, because the harmony costs involved in those are even worse. So I can imagine starting along a line like yours, but I haven't pursued it. It is true in general that one of the great potential uh, profound contributions of the idea that a symbol is a distributed activation pattern is that it gives us the means of talking about how symbols are created. You don't have to take it as a given that you're, somebody gives you a bunch of symbols and that's the starting point. Symbols can be something that get created from something more basic, which are the activation values. And so I think that is a really important general direction uh, in which my work has not really gone. But I, I think it's maybe more important than some of the directions my work has gone in. Uh, fragmentation, uh, so th th this has something to do with quantum theory and superpositions and stuff, but you have to tell me what it is, yes, what fragmentation is. Saying that there's a danger in, in looking conceptually at things as... There's a, I'm sorry, there's a what? There's a danger to danger. looking at things uh, as fragments, and uh, it seems like there's a lot of, I don't know, fragmentation going on in this kind of theory. So like you're, you're reducing things to, to parts, like to, to neurons and, and so on, so like, like where do you stop? Fragmenting it to, at what level do you stop kind of analyzing parts? Uh, what's the danger? Um, well, you're saying that there are, there's like things like uh, observation of things affects their uh, how we perceive them. So, like when you look at a the position of an electron, you can't you can never know the, the position and velocity. Uh, I don't know. There just seems to be some sort of relation here. How you do the analysis of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the constituent parts of, of the theory? Well, um, I guess I can't give a very uh, informed answer to that question. Uh, I tend to think about um, the way in which the theory is about aggregating uh, many small microscopic elements into something. No, more macroscopic, which is the opposite of the direction that you were talking about. Uh, I think of the, the lower level as somehow more uh, prior, uh, and therefore that to the extent that symbols are real, it must be because they're built out of physical properties of neural networks or something. And so I think of it more as about aggregation than fragmentation, but certainly viewed from the top, we're taking symbols and fragmenting them into pieces. I guess I'm just saying that there's the value of trying to look from top down also, I think, from trying to build them from 
Well, what I was trying to say is it's, it's looking top down that makes it look like fragmentation. And if you look bottom up, it looks like uh, the opposite. Okay, we have time for one more question. Funny you should ask. OK, so I have, I have two uh, answers. Uh, the first is that um, the notion of grammars as optimization systems uh, came from this work. It didn't pre-exist it. And so optimality theory, for example, uh, is a theory that lives entirely in the symbolic realm, uh, but is uh, to the extent that it has made contributions, it is some uh, cashing out of the value for macro theory of looking at what macroscopic structure is likely to be like if it emerges from uh, microstructure. So that would be my first answer. And that's not too speculative, because we've worked on that for some time. Uh, on a more speculative vein, we have been uh, looking at uh, a notion that we call gradient symbol structures. Uh, if you look at the points off the grid, you can think of them as an activation pattern, but you can also think of them as a, as a, uh, a set of gradient, uh, a collection of gradient symbols that have been uh, combined into different symbolic roles. So uh, an activation pattern might be interpretable as you know 0.9d plus 0.1t, uh, and if you, and we're trying to understand in a sort of similar way, what would calculation with gradient symbol structures be like if what it summarizes is really just what's going on below? Uh, and there are some very interesting things there. So the two answers are related in the following way. The first, uh, well, about optimality theory, um, optimality theory has um, difficulty producing certain kinds of patterns in phonology. Uh, which were uh, handled better, um, arguably and probably, uh, by um, previous theories of grammar that involved serially applying manipulations uh, to modify sound uh, structures. Um, so these so-called opacity effects uh, cannot be naturally handled by optimality theory. A lot of work has gone into trying to understand how we have to modify the theory to account for them. But if you're using harmonic grammar uh, with gradient symbols, it turns out you can get certain opacity effects that you couldn't get otherwise. Um, because you can have uh, fragments of symbols that actually have grammatical Im implications. Um, so if you were forced to the grid points, they would go away. Uh, but to the extent that uh, we attribute some sort of psychological reality to points off the grid, and if they really are neural states, why not? then um, uh, we might be able to see entirely new kinds of phonological, for example, effects uh, stated over symbols, but now gradient symbols. Matt Goldrick is doing that work, primarily. And it's pretty amazing, if you ask me. Thank you.